Good morning. Happy Africa Day. Amen. I think we need more days for Africa. We are in trouble. Um, I, must, I must thank that uh, group that sang here yeah, beautifully. I mean, there was a guy who was singing bass. You could tell he's the SRC president. <laughs> he represented us very well. Thank you very much. Um, I want us to go to the book of Hebrews. Let me tell you, one of the questions that always trouble me, and, and many others, I'm sure, is, um, actually there are two. Some people ask the question, are these people serious about heaven? So people who are not convinced about this idea about heaven. One of the reasons why they are not convinced about heaven is they look at those who are convinced about heaven and then they say, really? I mean, seriously? Are these guys serious about what they are convinced of? They're looking at the life we live and what we do and they begin to wonder what type of heaven is this? I've, there are another question that we have asked, I've asked myself also is, are we really serious about heaven, really? Which heaven are we going to? When you see what leaders do, I've been in this <laughs> business for the last 37 years, and I've seen things with my eyes, not only what others have done, what I have done also. I've seen things, and, and the question really is, which heaven are we going to? When we've got two leaders that cannot speak to each other, and both of them are going to heaven, which heaven are they going to? When we have um, the mother and the father divorcing, and both of them are Christians. Which heaven are they going to? When, when, when Christians do things and stuff to each other, and both of them are singing, we are, on our, we are marching over to Jerusalem. Which Jerusalem is that? Now, what I'm trying to say is sometimes we are not very serious. Yes, we believe but we're not very serious about this whole idea of heaven. And that's what I want, us, I want us to look at, probably look at why heaven is important and what that means, what it means here on earth. Not that I'm going to heaven, but what it means here on earth. And uh, I want us to turn our eyes and our minds and look at that. Now, if you read with me Hebrews 11, if you read with me Hebrews 11, Verse 22, it says that by faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. It doesn't say much until you get the whole context. All it says here is Joseph, when he was dying, gave instructions to his brothers, to his family. He said, guys, when um, um, I'm, I'm dying, and he gave them the instruction concerning his bones. Paul, uh, the author here, doesn't really expound as to what that promise is. Now we have to, or that instruction was, we have to go to Genesis 50 to understand the content of the instruction. It just says he gave them instruction concerning his bones, and he did that by faith. So it was a huge thing, according to Hebrews. I mean, you, you have a list of, of people who have done wonderful things, the most wonderful thing that Joseph did, according to Hebrews 11, was to give instruction concerning his bones. Others were slaughtered, others were sown, in, were, were cut in two, others were martyred, others whatever, but Joseph gave instruction concerning his bones. And that's what we read. Now for us to understand the context, we have to go to... Um, or understand this instruction, we have to go to Genesis 50. Remember what we are trying to do, uh, we're trying to inject some seriousness on, on, on what we believe about heaven. Genesis 50, 24 says, and Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land 
which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So that was the instruction about the bones. The instruction concerning the bones was, I'm going to die, but, but God is going to visit you. And when God does that, when God visits you, please, when you leave this place to the land that God promised to Isaac, to Jacob, to Abraham, when you leave, as God's children leave Egypt, please don't leave my bones in this land. Take my bones with you. That's amazing. It's very profound, and as you, as you will see, um, now we read in Exodus 30, 13, verse 19. This is now almost 300 years later. The bones are still in Egypt. Because remember, Joseph dies at the age of 110. They remained there when they started, when they arrived, um, the first group arrived. They were there for 400 years. And by the time they arrived, the Joseph was almost 30 years or so, uh, so he lived 110, that would be 80 years, uh, and they stayed 400 years, I mean Israel. So you're looking at 300, 320 years before they left Egypt. And so, over 300 years later, in Exodus 13, verse 19, we read the following. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed the children of Israel under solemn oath, that is now Joseph, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here with you. 300 years before, Joseph lies there, he's dying. He says, the Lord will visit you. And when he does, don't let my bones remain in this land. Don't let my bones remain in, in Egypt. Take my bones with you. And they remembered 300 years later, they remembered that Joseph, 300 years ago, remember, these, these are not the brothers, because brothers have died. They didn't live 300 years. This, this is the next and the other generation later on, descendants of Joseph. And they remembered what their great, 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 great father, uh, Joseph, had, 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 had instructed his brethren. And so they picked up these bones. Now, you still have to go with me to Joshua 24, verse 32, and then we can actually lay him to rest now. That is Joseph. Joshua 24, um, verse 32. This is the last, almost the last verse uh, in, uh, in that book of Joshua. Then it says here, yeah, verse 32, the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel had brought up out of Egypt, they buried at Shechem in the plot of ground which Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamer, the father of Shechem, for 100 pieces of silver, and which had become an inheritance of the children of Joseph. Finally, 300 years later, after the instruction was given, Joseph is buried. He is laid to rest in the land of, in the land of Canaan, the land that God had promised to Abraham. And indeed, God visited. He led them out of Egypt, the land of bondage, carried them through the wilderness for almost 40 years, and he rooted them in the land of Canaan. And there they buried Joseph and followed his instruction. Now the question I want to ask, or what appears on surface, on the surface is that Joseph may, must have been very uh, unhappy in Egypt for him to give this kind of instruction. You would think, he says, guys, I don't want my bones to remain here. This is the land of captivity. I want my bones to go and, and symbolically, I want my bones to be taken to the land that God has promised. But you've got to still have to read um, one more text to get the part, the gist, and understand what Joseph had in mind. Now, we think in our minds he must have had a terrible experience, but we know it was not so because Joseph was the second in command in Egypt. If there was a guy who had the best life in Egypt, it was Joseph. Joseph was not a slave. 
in Egypt. He came as a slave, but he, he became the second in command. He was not a slave. So these words are coming from someone who had everything. Someone was powerful. He was second only to Pharaoh. Actually, in his death when he died, he was embalmed. That was only reserved for the Pharaohs. So he was treated like Pharaoh. But all we know is when he was dying, this man says, my heart is not in this land. I mean, that land, I promise you, there must have been universities after Joseph. Highways after Joseph, buildings after Joseph, schools after Joseph, Joseph Road, Joseph Main Road, Joseph Boulevard, Joseph High School, Joseph University, whatever, Joseph Airport. Joseph was famous in Egypt, but when he died, he says, I don't belong here. It, it, it tells me something about Joseph, that throughout his life, Joseph kept singing a song that I'm a stranger here and I'm, no way I'm going to die here even though I've got everything. Now, if you go to Hebrews 11, because that's where we get the idea uh, that we find there of this instruction, what actually is happening here? What, what is Joseph saying here when he, he gives this instruction concerning his bones? He says in verse 15, uh, these all died in faith. That doesn't mean now, this means, this includes Joseph, all right? These died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, they were assured of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That would be Joseph also. I'm a stranger, maybe second in command, but I'm a stranger. I'm a pilgrim, not only in Egypt, but on the earth. Because there the comparison not just between Egypt and heaven. Egypt is Egypt and Canaan, but earth is earth and heaven. You get the point? So when we talk about Egypt, all right, then there's Canaan, but that's still part of earth. But Canaan is a symbol of heaven. Egypt is a symbol of the earth. So there were strangers on earth, citizens of heaven. And then it says, for those who say such things, declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. Now, verse 16 says, but now they desire a better country or a better, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared a city for them. We'll come back later for this, on this part of the city. So Joseph looked for a better country. In Egypt, Egypt was a good country. The text doesn't say he was looking for a good country. Because if he was looking for a good country, then it would mean that Egypt was a bad country. Now, Egypt for Joseph was not a bad country. So Egypt, in its goodness, could not retain Joseph. Joseph says, yes, it's good, but I look for a better country. A better country that has been promised. He had everything he needed, yet he still longed for a better country. Now, we're going to, we're going to, we, have to, we have to talk about that. We have to talk about that better country. If Joseph had everything, why was he so obsessed about God's promise of a better country? Because for some of us, going to heaven, <laughs> we want to go to heaven because we're so poor. You know, sometimes we wonder why rich people want to go to heaven. Because we said they've already experienced their heaven here. So when you have everything, the desire for heaven reduces. Gets minimized. And some of us are so holy, not because we, uh, we are in the true sense holy, but we're just feeling like this world is not our place because we are out of place. We have nothing. We're looking for something better. And that's why when some of us get a chance to go to America, they say, what? I'm in heaven. I'm not going back to Africa. So it, it, this, this mentality of escaping, running away, it, it is the same. Now, there's a problem. There's a problem when you want to go to heaven because you're escaping something. But Joseph was not escaping. He had done his part. He says, thank you. This was good. But I long for a better country. So he is longing was not born out of escapism. It was not born out of this desire for gold or for fruit that he never had on planet Earth. 
Some people have laughed at Christians and they say, the reason why you want to go to heaven, it is because you're a failure and you're longing for heaven. You're lazy. You're longing for a place where you're going to sleep for eternity. So heaven becomes a place for the poor. It becomes a place for Africans. Because those who are rich have got their small heavens here. So we look at their houses, we say, oh, he has a small heaven. I don't know whether you say that also here. Small heaven. It's Zuluan. Yo, his house is a small heaven. You don't know what heaven is. You think heaven is just big size. There's more to heaven than just the beauty. And this is what I want to raise right now. Because if heaven is comfort, if heaven is, is, is beauty, then if you can amass that beauty, then the desire for heaven will not be there. So what was Joseph longing for? What are we longing for, beloved, when we long for heaven? And I'm telling you, this is very important. Because that which you are longing for in heaven, you must experience it here. And the reason why we lose sight of heaven, it is because what we are longing for, we are not experiencing it here. If your longing for heaven is actually a longing to walk on the street of gold, and you are walking on the street of dust here, there's no heaven for you. So the heaven you are longing for, you must experience here. That, that's what pushes you. You've got to taste what you are longing for here on earth. And once you taste it, you will say, there's no way I'm going to miss this. I've tasted it already. You can't go to heaven because your lips are dry. Because the moment you get something on earth that wets those lips, you'll forget about heaven. You can't go to heaven because you have no money, because the day you have money, you'll forget about heaven. You can't go to heaven because you have no car, you have no riches, because the day you, you have those things, you'll forget about heaven. There must be something about heaven that is so amazing, that is so unique. And this is what I want us to look at this morning. What was he longing for? I come back to that text I said I'll come back to. Uh, again, Hebrews eleven fifteen. 15. He says, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he had prepared a city for them. All right, walk with me. So you would say in your mind, Joseph wants to be in the city of God. He wants to enjoy and be part of that city. City of Bulawayo, there's no promise there. We were given a ticket with uh, my, my friend there, and they said we were parked on a yellow lane. I said, where is the yellow lane here? They said, see, it's there. there there's a yellow lane here. <laughs> where is the yellow lane? That thing was there maybe 15 years ago was painted. That paint has eroded, but people are still punished and they're made to pay. For a yellow lane, that does not exist. And that makes you long for heaven, where there are no yellow lanes. And says here, God has prepared them a city. He has prepared a city for them. And is not ashamed to be called their God. But that city is not just buildings. It is not just roads. John 14, 1 to 3, he says, so that where I am, you may be also. You see, the city is actually where God is. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'll come back for you. So that where I am, you may be also. There's the secret. Joseph wanted to be with his master. Joseph longed to be, he longed to be with God. He longed to be with God. <laughs> he longed to be with God. Do you know why he longed to be with God? Because God was with him here on earth. And that's, that, that's where we miss it, beloved. Uh, uh, that's, that's where we miss it. We can be the president of general conference, the president or whatever. We can be the SRC president. We can be, we can be president, president. This. But here's the beauty, beloved. In all our achievements, if the Lord is not with you, you can never long to be with him. And that's where we miss it. That's why we miss it. We sing, we worship, we do all kinds of things, but there's an experience we're lacking. The Lord is not with us, and therefore, the desire to be with him is also lacking. 
You ask, but what, 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 how, am I, how, how am I raising that? <laughs> Genesis 39, verse 2. Have you read that text? It says, and the Lord was with Joseph. <laughs> and the Lord was with Joseph. And when he dies, he says, I want to be with the Lord. I want to be with the Lord that was with me. Reminds me of the three boys who were thrown into the fire. Just before they were thrown to that lake of fire, into that uh, fire, fiery furnace, they say, the Lord who, whom we serve is going to save us. To, the Lord we serve now is going to save us. The Lord we serve now, you will say, oh man. Who's going to save you? The answer is the one you are serving. So who are you serving? So Joseph longed for what he had tasted. He longed, not for what was in his mind, imaginary. He longed for what he had tasted, not imagination. He longed for what he had already tasted. This was not a pie in the sky. He had tasted the pie. And that pie was not found in Egypt. Not in the, in the echelons of Egypt. Not in the corridors of Egypt. Yes, he was there. He had seen it all. But there was something more wonderful. And it was not residing in Egypt. It was his relationship with God. And he says, when I die, when I die, I want to open my eyes and see the Lord who was with me. I want to be with him. So that where I am, you may be also. So for Joseph, this was not a one-day experience. One day. One day, my, my pastor, we will be in heaven. One day. Three more on African. One day, we'll be in heaven. But for Joseph, for Joseph, that day had already started. He was actually experiencing the one day in Egypt. And so when he dies, he says, I want to be with the Lord who was with me. And the Bible says, his master saw. <laughs> we don't have time to really work on this thing. His master saw that the Lord was with Joseph. He saw with his eyes. So this thing was not just in his mind, a private thing in his mind. Even those who were around him saw that the Lord was with him. They saw. Now, if they saw that the Lord was with him, by the way, this is how it reads. Then you can see how, how powerful this thing is. This is how it reads. Let me, let me give it to you. Um, where am I? Exodus. Let, 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 let me give it to you. This is how it reads um, in the full version. Let me give you the full version. It says, then, and his master saw, verse 3, that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So the master is saying, now everything that Joseph does prospers, but the master does not say it prospers because Joseph is intelligent. He says it prospers because the Lord is with him. It's the master, the heathen, the pagan, if you please, who does not know anything about the Lord. He says the Lord is with him. You don't need to go to and do theology for you to understand that. Joseph must have told the master that, sorry, sir, I'm Joseph and the Lord is with me. The master, is, the master must have said, what, what do you mean? You will see. Just watch. So the master could then attest that indeed the Lord is with you because I've seen with my eyes. He saw the prospect. He saw, his, he saw the, the progress. He saw um, the, 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 the development. He saw a change in his, in his, in his, in his empire. And then he says, this boy said the Lord is with him. So Joseph must have uh, got into a point where he never consulted his principles. He never considered the fact that he's a worshiper of God. And I've often said to people, when you do your interviews, um, let them know that you worship the Lord. He <laughs> said, so you, you need to, so why should we employ you? Because the Lord is with me. Do you know people are afraid to employ people who, who speak like that? The moment you say the Lord is with oh, there's going to be prayer right and they will never work here. So sorry, we, we're here to work, not to pray. I know of people who go to work 
and when it's break time, they are, when they are doing Bible studies, that's beautiful. And sometimes even into the, into the working hours, they are doing Bible studies. And when the master comes, they run away because they were stealing his time and doing Bible studies. I remember, a, I remember I shouldn't tell this story, but <laughs> I remember a person I work with. Let me put it that way. Many, many years ago, I was very young then, so don't, don't do this at home. So I, so I came in. She was supposed to do something for me. Um, she was my assistant. And then I got to the office where she was. She was busy praying, which is good, because um, the Lord is with her. And uh, five minutes later, he was, she was still praying. That was a long prayer. Um, and uh, so, but I, I had a deadline, so I had to ask her to stop praying and write the email. Send the email. Then lunchtime, you can start where you have stopped. This time is time for working, not for praying. But pastor, this is, uh, this is the office. This is, this, hey, 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 here. You are employed to work, not to pray. You pray at home. You pray during prayer time. You pray break. You pray lunch. You don't pray when I'm supposed to be working. Or oh, the lady is late now. You didn't die. She didn't die because of that. It was a old age later on. But here is the point, beloved. Here is the point which Joseph was able to make to to to, to actually um, embrace and 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 understand that when you say the Lord is with you. You don't go about like a zombie praying and doing, reciting Psalms, Psalms 23. You work! When it's time to work. And the Bible says, the Lord made everything that he did to prosper in his hand. He was successful, the Bible says. The Lord was with him and Joseph was successful. You know why Joseph was successful? It is because Joseph longed for heaven. Heaven is a place of people who are successful. Not failures. You don't fail your assignment and think you're going to make it to heaven. And some of us are going to remain here longer until we pass all our assignments. You're not, you're not going to die. Even if there's an accident, you're not going to die because you still have to finish your assignment. Paul says, before he dies, I've done everything. I've run the race. I've finished my assignment. Now I'm ready. You've got to finish what God has given you. You see, the problem, people who, who, who look upon us and, 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 and laugh at heaven, it is because we are so heavenly-minded, and as they say, and no earthly good. There is no contribution we are making on this earth. All we are busy about, we are marching over to Jerusalem. Let me tell you what it means to be successful in the biblical context. What does it mean to be successful? In the story of Joseph, at least, what does it mean to be successful? Of course, number one, the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. He was good at what he did. And those of you who are going to start to be pastors, you are starting to be pastors, be a good pastor. Don't just be a pastor that wears a nice suit. Be a good pastor. Preach well. Visit your members. Do your work. Submit your reports if you want to go to heaven. Those things are important. I, I, I've worked with pastors I know, and I'm, I'm just talking to my friends here. I've worked with pastors that I know that. It's very easy to be a good preacher but not be a good pastor. There's more to pastoring than preaching. And those of you who are going to be um, 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 computer, whatever, specialists, do a good job. There was a guy who was a computer something, they come to our office and he fix your computer and by the time he leaves, everything is off. The lights can't come up. They, they, they're hot. <laughs> and we have to demote him. We actually have to sit down and say, you know what? You, 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 I mean, he was supposed to be a director of whatever. He says, no, go and work in the, in the grass and cut the grass. You're not, you're not fit for this. Some of you have, have got certificates, but you can't do what is written in the certificate. All you say is, we're going to heaven. Which heaven are you going to go to? You're going to be a nurse. You're going to be a doctor. I don't know what else you want to be here. You're going to run a business, but do it very well. Don't be like these people who go around writing receipts for, of yellow legs that don't exist. He was good at what he did. People who are going to heaven, beloved, make a contribution where they are. And it starts by being a good student. There's a deadline, I always say to the students. There's a deadline for a good reason, to discipline you. When you give you a deadline, we are trying to mold your character. Work towards a deadline. 23rd, 8 o'clock, the assignment is due. Bring it on the 21st. Bring it on the 20th. Bring it a week before. 
Who coming up with all kinds of excuses? Uh, this, I was sick. If you had done it earlier, you would have been sick and the thing would have been in. I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. Finish up your assignment. Do your assignment. It's, it's important when you do that. It shows that you are going to heaven. People must see that you are going to heaven. When you submit an assignment, let me read and see that you have checked your spelling. I wrote to someone, I says, you know when, when the computer underlines red, put red, like in red, check that, check that word if it's correct, if that's the right spelling. Don't, don't submit it to me like that. Because it's a reflection of your character. Think through. When you submit an assignment, think about God. Would God be excited about what you are pre- presenting now? Here's another definition of success. So for people who are going to heaven, they have self-control. Self-control. Self-control means that which I would like to do, I will not do because it is wrong. Self-control is not you doing the things you don't want to do. Self-control is you not doing the things you would want to do. I don't smoke. I hate smoking. I don't need self-control for smoking. Because I hate it. But there are things I love, but I mustn't do. I need self-control. I'm not talking about self-restraint. I'm talking about self-control. I must be able to say to myself, not to you, no, Papu, no. That's self-control. That is what you expect from a person who's successful. And you see that in the story of Joseph. When Mrs. Potiphar, I don't blame her, she had all reasonable reasons. She had, oh, by the way, Mrs. Potiphar had good reasons for wanting Joseph to sleep with her. With her. Very good reasons. The, the woman was miserable. <laughs> well, if you had time, you'll read the story. She had a problem with her husband. And she thought that Joseph is, is, is going to take the place of her husband. Joseph says, no, I'm not married to you. You are married to my boss. You're not married to me. So I'm not going to sleep with you. If you have problems, go deal with those problems with your father, with, with, your, with, your, with, with, with my boss, with your husband. Don't come to me. And then he says, you know the story there in verse 9? He says, because you are his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And so some of you hear Joseph saying, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? As if Joseph is rebuking the woman. No, Joseph is rebuking himself. How can I? How can I? Not how can you? How can I? He's not saying, how can you tempt me? How can you say this thing to me? How can, after all, how can you? No, no, how can I? I, me, because the Lord is with me. He may not be with you, he's with me. How can I? You can do it, but I can't do it. How can I? So Joseph, when Joseph said no, he was saying no to Joseph. Joseph, no, Joseph, jo- Joseph, no. This is wickedness. Now I've heard people say, but pastor, uh, what else was I supposed to do? I was tempted. Uh, uh, said, even if you were there. Somebody was preaching about Joseph in one, in one, not preaching, teaching. Unfortunately, I came after him. So he was saying, so he was saying during the lesson, he was saying, ah, oh, if, even if you were there like Joseph, yo, yo, you would have done it. So <laughs> I said, speak for yourself. Speak for yourself. Say you would have done it. So we tend to blame the environment. No, I was tempted. Of course, you are tempted. Temptation does this. I don't give you the right to fall in, in it to, to yield. You are tempted. So you think you are right when you are not tempted. So some of us become good when they're not tempted. The moment they are tempted, they become bad. As long as there's no temptation, Pastor, I'll be fine. <laughs> That's heaven. That will be in heaven. But you must learn to do that here in the midst of temptation. And so Joseph says, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And so Joseph ran with his body. You've heard me say that over and over many times. And Joseph ran with his body. Well, that body belonged to God. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? He ran with God's body. And he left the jacket or the blanket or whatever he was wearing. Because that one does not belong to God. You can take the jacket, but the body is gone. (laughs) Ran with God's body. And you know what I'm going to say next here? Some of us run with the jacket and we leave the body behind. (laughs) 
because the jacket is more expensive than the body. The shoes are more expensive than the feet. The cap is more expensive than the head. The car is more expensive than you, so you live there. You, in, order, in order to get the car, you sell the body. Ha! In order, in order to get the jacket, you sell the body. That's how you leave the body behind and run with the jacket. In order to get the shoes, you sell your body. This is self-control, beloved. It is saying no to yourself. Joseph was 30 years old. He was not a homosexual. He was 30 years old. This was a woman that was attractive. He was not very old. You see, the Bible writes that because it was a temptation. Temptation is, is, is being tempted to do what you can do and that, would, that, that which you would enjoy doing. That's temptation. You are not tempted to jump to the moon because it's impossible. But that's not a temptation. If I say to you, jump to the moon, you are always tempted, pastor, to jump to the moon. <laughs> that's not a temptation because you can't jump to the moon. When a hundred-year-old woman passes by and says, come, sleep with me, that's not a temptation. I, old, that's not a temptation. You know, there are people who, bo- who boast as if they've, they've, they are strong when they are not tempted. <laughs> Ladies, you know this guy, Norma, this one, this one, who serves there in the SRC, this one, he was talking to me and saying he loves me. I told him, I told him, don't, don't, live in the, don't, hey, don't try that. I, she thinks she's strong. She thinks she's strong. She thinks she's like Joseph. Yeah. Only to find out, no, you don't love the person. She's ugly. Let's wait until you see somebody who's attractive. Let's see what you're going to say. You boast of being strong when you have not been tempted. That's not a temptation. Temptation is being tempted, being invited to do something you can do, something you can love to do, something that would be nice. You are not tempted to kill yourself. Kill yourself, that's not a temptation because it's painful. But temptation is when you are tempted to do something you would like to do. And Joseph said no. So it is no to Joseph. When you have said yes to God, you can say no to others. Remember the question is that, uh, is it okay for me to date? Maybe the best thing is to date God first. But that's, that's not all. Joseph goes into prison, and the Bible says, but the Lord was with him in, in prison. Here is the story of a successful person, resilient. When you face challenges, don't crumble. Hospitals are full of people who are depressed. I'm here, I uh, lost my business. I lost my car, so I chose to be depressed. Stand up and fight. It's a resilient. Resilient is the ability to stand and not to allow the situation to destroy you. So Joseph was in prison. You thought he was going to be depressed in prison for a crime he did not commit, beloved. He did not commit the crime. He was, he was in prison. <sighs> he said so. He says, I didn't, I'm not supposed to be here. But the Bible says when Joseph was walking around and he noticed one inmate who was looking sad. You know, you know how Joseph noticed a, an inmate was looking sad? Because Joseph was not sad. In prison, he was not sad. He was visiting others, trying to cheer them up. That's why he was able to tell the, uh, translate or interpret the dream for this guy. Because Joseph, in prison, was in charge in prison. You thought you were only in charge in Potiphar's house, in prison. But guys, ladies, brothers and sisters, we need to thrive also in the midst of trials. We need to be able to stand when others are not able to stand. You see, going to heaven is very, is very easy. I mean, just jumping into heaven is very easy. But for heaven to come where you are, that's the most difficult part. What God wants to do, beloved, is to be with us, to let the world know what it means when a young man walks with the Lord. Amen. When God works with a young man. Now, by the time you're going to heaven, you've already shown that heaven began the day I gave my heart to Jesus. And when I was walking, it says about Enoch, he walked with God for 300 years and the Lord took him. Because there's no way you can walk with me for 300 years and then I leave you. And Joseph walked with the Lord for almost eight years. And when he was dying, he says, don't leave my bones here. I want to be with the Lord. It's amazing. Beautiful. 
And the last part you see in Joseph is his forgiving spirit. You know, some people make it in life and they struggle on the forgiveness. They said, now it's payback time for all those who did these things to me when I was growing up. It's payback time. The guy has everything, but he's still a slave to his hatred. He has been reduced to, to a point where now he hates his enemies. There is nothing as miserable as a person who is enslaved by his enemies. Do you know when you don't forgive a person, you allow him to control your heart? You know how that happens? If I have not forgiven, if I have a problem with you for what you have done to me, and I come through that door and I see you coming out, chances are I won't get in, I'll leave. When I eat and you show up, I, appetite disappears. You control me, literally. Just thinking about you creates headache. Just thinking about you. When you forgive, you're letting yourself free. Not so much the, pe the person, but yourself free. I have no time for this. You know, when the brothers came to Joseph and says, Joseph, forgive us for what we have done. Joseph says, am I in the place of God? You guys did bad things to me, but God had a plan. You see, you guys tried everything, but you failed because God had a plan. So why should I be angry? You are not fighting me, you are fighting God. People with dreams are a threat to those who don't have dreams. So you can understand. You know, you know hating somebody is understandable because you would like to be where he is, but you can't. And Joseph was able to forgive his enemies. You know why he did that? Because Joseph was going to heaven. And this whole business of forgiveness is just another chapter on its own, beloved. I mean, somebody said, somebody said, if, if you go to heaven, we, 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 on the resurrection day, we are climbing up on a, on a cloud, and then I see you in the cloud on our way to heaven. He says, in my language, you'll understand it better in my language. I'll say it in English as well. He says, Dao Kledika, Dao Kledika, Quello Leaf, Dao Kledika, Quello Leaf. In other words, I'll just get off. I'll just say, Cloud, go without me. I am not going to go to heaven with this guy. I'm remaining. I'd rather go to hell. And that's where you will be. That's where you will go. For not forgiving makes hell attractive. But when you, when you are going to heaven and serious about heaven, you, 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 have the, you have the appetite for forgiveness. Because, man, you're going to be in heaven forever. What are you going to do with this person who you are not forgiving? How are you going to stay with him forever in heaven? Are you always going to be running out? Hey, here's this guy again. In heaven, for eternity, here's this guy again. By the way, when I, when I talk about heaven and talk about heaven and eternity, I'm not talking about heaven. I'm talking about New Jerusalem, all right? New Jerusalem comes out of heaven. We are in heaven for a thousand years. New Jerusalem comes out of heaven. But because New Jerusalem and heaven, are, are, the climate is the same, we just use the word heaven. Technically. So how are you going to enjoy eternity if you can't stay with your enemy, if you can't be comfortable in the presence of your enemy? And the Bible says uh, in Psalms 23, um, he spreads a table before my enemies. I can eat before my enemies. If you can't eat before your enemies, then that means you have not forgiven your enemies. The Lord was with Joseph, and so Joseph wanted to be with the Lord. So when Joseph gave instructions, beloved, Joseph was serious about heaven. No, I'm married. I've been married now for 36 years. I've been in the ministry for over 37 years. <sighs> Once in a while, I would say to my wife, honey, do you know that I'm serious about heaven? <laughs> you really are honestly serious. I want to go to heaven. And it's always good to stay with a person and be married to a person who is serious about heaven. And as some of you are going to choose beautiful women. And by the way, the reason we are here at Solis is to make sure by the time you leave here, you've, got, you've chosen someone. Because if you can't get somebody here after staying for four years, you're not going to get that person anyway. 
I'm talking to our pastors here. Just make sure that the Lord is going to guide you. There's someone for you here. Nothing wrong with that. That's one of the reasons why we are here. But if the Lord has already granted you one at home, that's fine. You can stay with that one. But it gets more challenging to be a pastor and be looking amongst your sheep for a wife. That was just an advert. (laughs) You didn't pay for that one. But the point here is, there is nothing so painful as being married to a person who has no interest, who is not going to heaven. Because it will take you to where she is going or he is going. Actually, in life, you create your destination. If you are going to hell, you make sure where you are, there is hell. Because you, you want to get used to where you are going. People who are going to hell, they make their homes hell. Because they want to acclimatize to where they are going. It's why it's important to be married or to be, to be connected to a person who's going to, who wants to go to heaven. Because that person, therefore, creates heaven where he is. So your home becomes heaven. Because you're married to a person who wants to go to heaven. It makes a big difference, beloved, to have a leader. That's Solusi, who wants to go to heaven because then he makes Solusi to be heavenly because he wants to go to heaven. But if he doesn't want to go to heaven, Solusi will become hell. And so when we look for leaders, when we look for pastors, when we look for presidents, let's first check, does he want to go to heaven? If the answer is no, leave him because he's going to create hell for all of us. And so, let me say this. I know I'm not going to be popular after this, but let me say this. That Joseph, when we read Patterson and Prophets, for those who have read the book, it was on his way to Egypt where he gave himself to God and said, I want the Lord to be with me. So invite God to be with you. God does not just descend and be with you. Now, let me read the quotation. Patterson and Prophets 214, you read it at home. Joseph believed that the God of his fathers would be his God. He then and there gave himself fully to the Lord, and he prayed that the keep of Israel would be with him in the land of his exile. In the wilderness, the decision was made. In Egypt, it was implemented, and the Lord was with Joseph. The question I would ask you as I close, have you decided that the Lord should be your Lord, that the Lord should be with you? Because if you don't make that decision, it's going to be very difficult for God to be with you. The Bible presents Christ as knocking, never bulldozes. He's so powerful, he doesn't need to knock. He can be inside without knocking. (laughs) But he knocks so that when he's inside, it could be, it would be because of your permission. So he says, knock, permit me to come in so that I can be with you. I can eat with you. If you don't open, I will not get in. Even though I can open, I will not get in. This is the God we worship. So he knocked in the heart of Joseph, and Joseph, faced with trials and temptations and difficulties, at the back of the caravan, made his decision. Lord, you can come in now. Let's walk together. Beloved, it makes sense to walk with the Lord. It's amazing when the Lord is with you, you can never be disadvantaged. Only like the boy who said to me, Pastor, I'm in my class, I pray. They ask me when there's prayer to be done. I'm the one who does the prayer. I'm the one who does this, but I'm struggling with my geography. I fail my geography. I said, maybe you should stop praying and, and focus on doing your geography. What I'm trying to say, beloved, is when the Lord is with you, the Lord will not attach his name to a failure. When the Lord attaches his name to you, he will make you successful. As I close, I'll ask you that question. Have you given your heart to God? Have you given your heart to Jesus? It makes sense to do that. It makes sense to do that. We're not going to uh, work on our, on, our, on our questions today, but you've got the papers there. Um, the elders doing the papers. If you want to write in that paper and just say, 
I would like to give my life to God or even dedicate my life. I had once done that, but because of the long journey, things have not been what I want them to be. I would like to rededicate my life to God. You can put it on that paper, and then what we're going to do with the papers, uh, when, when we leave, you can drop them, um, because we're going to close now. You can drop the paper. Just write your decision. This is my decision. You don't need to consult with your friend sitting next to you. You found him here. He didn't bring you here. It's God who brought you here. So you write there, this is my decision. I would like to give my life to God. Or I would like to rededicate my life to God and recommit my life to God so that the Lord will be, will, will be with me and people will see that the Lord is with me. My lecturers, the friends, and everyone I meet will know that the Lord is with me in the way I do um, my assignment, in the way I treat my body, in the way I deal with the difficulties I face in my life, in the way I relate to those who have a problem with me because the Lord is with me. So indicate your decision there and pray. Oh, by the way, write your name so that we, I can be able, because those papers will come to me and then in the remaining few days, I can be able to connect with you as well. Um, if you write your name, I don't know how I'm going to know how to get hold of you, but uh, just write your name. We will find you. <laughs> All right. Write your name and say, this is my decision. Or oh, I need prayers. If you need prayers, indicate that I need prayers. I'm struggling with something that, that has been haunting me for years. I need prayers of deliverance. And that's the reason why we are here. It's also to help us uh, um, uh, experience um, freedom in Christ. Let us pray together. Our kind and loving Father, thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. It's Africa Day, dear God. There are so many challenges besetting Africa, so many of them. Almost all the countries and the states in Africa come, they promise, and then they go down, and our hopes are dashed. There are few that are promising, but it's, it's, there's, there's no light that we can see. But here we are, dear Father, as the sons of Africa. And we know, and I know we've just been assured here, if we allow you to walk with us, not only will we brighten the corners where we are, we will lift up Africa. Because if you lift us up, Lord, there's no way our continent would remain what it is. We need young men and women, Lord, who are committed here in front of me, are men and women who are going to lead this country, other countries where they come from, in many ways, dear Father, but if they can allow you to lead them, to make a big difference. This world, these countries we represent, will look like heaven. They'll be heavenly. Because, dear Father, we are the ones who are leading and there's heaven in our minds. We know our countries are what they are because some of the leaders who lead us are attracted to a place that is opposite heaven, and therefore they create hell wherever they are. And may we be those leaders here on earth because we are going to heaven. May it be said that we made this place a better place. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.